This program is about hackers, the computer wizards who in just a decade created both a multi-billion dollar industry and a cultural phenomenon. In the next half hour, we'll meet some of the heroes of the personal computer revolution. People like Steve Wozniak, designer of the Apple computer, video game whiz Bill Budge, and Macintosh programmer Andy Hertzfeld. We'll also find out how the hackers created the personal computer as a labor of love, and why their breakthroughs may transform the way we think, work, and play. Already millions of personal computers are changing our daily lives at work, at school, and at home. At the touch of a button, you can now correct a letter without retyping it, recalculate complex financial projections, or send electronic mail across the world. Hundreds of programs let you manage your money, draw on your screen, teach your kids to type, and play shoot 'em ups or adventure games. Yet we often forget that this universe of digital code and silicon chips was hacked away for nights on end by brilliant and fanatic designers. And while a happy few struck gold and became overnight millionaires, many early pioneers were less fortunate. As a group, hackers still are the unsung heroes of the electronic age. One longtime supporter of hackers is Stuart Brand, editor of the Whole Earth Catalogs. They are uh, shy, sweet, incredibly brilliant, and uh, I think more effective in pushing the culture around now in good ways than almost any group I can think of. To make his point, Brand invited a hundred top computer designers to an exclusive hackers conference in this secluded campsite north of San Francisco. Everybody wants breakfast, now's the time. Despite bad weather and crude living conditions, the camp was a true hacker heaven. Well stocked with plenty of computer toys and of course, enough candy and soda to last through the night. But the real purpose of the get-together was to discuss the unique set of values that made the computer revolution possible and brainstorm about its future. My political platform is that we need an electronic declaration of independence. My project is to make all software free. I want to talk to people who are interested in uh, taking high school kids and turning them into us. Oh. <laughs> There's also a good opportunity to set the record straight on what hackers really stand for. A hacker is just a person who hacks away at the computer keyboard until the program works. Now, a cracker, on the other hand, is almost the same thing. He just hacks away at that keyboard, but until he breaks into, cracks the system security on a computer. A hacker never finishes a program. A hacker will get to a point where a program does something and maybe take a deep breath and say, how can I make it do this? How can I make it do that? And it'll just keep working. And the hacker often won't shut off the computer until he collapses at the keyboard or something. They do not have so much the normal friends to distract them, other activities to go to. They don't generally have girlfriends. Anything that's going to need a large attachment, commitment of their time, the computer is it and only it. Next. Uh, my name's Andrew Hertzfeld. I bought and fell in love with an Apple II in 1978, went to work for Apple in 1979, and was lucky enough to help design the Macintosh. Andy Hertzfeld is perhaps the best example of the modern-day hacker, driven by the same pure spirit as his predecessors, yet working within a commercial framework. He designed his latest hack in one weekend, just in time for the conference. So my uh, hack for the Hackers Conference is this uh, program that allows you to switch very quickly between programs on the Mac. And I have it set up here so you can uh, switch between them in uh, less than a second's worth of time. If you're doing something like this, it could take as much as a minute uh, to, get, to get in before. When it takes so long, you think, oh, maybe it's not worth it to include that extra little graphic embellishment in my letter. But if you can switch between it without even thinking about it, then you'll go to that extra trouble to make your letter look a little nicer. A few months later, Hertzfeld sold his program to Apple for a flat $100,000. But money wasn't the reason he came up with this hack in the first place. Instead, it was just the, the fun and joy of uh, seeing your programs working, uh, going from an idea to the realization of the idea, uh, and actually seeing it work. A lot of fun. 
being a hobbyist and taking your hobby seriously. Okay? So you can't be a hacker if you're a dilettante. If programming, for example, is something that you do you know, on Sunday afternoons and the rest of the time you don't think about it, then you're not a hacker. I think the hacker drive represents the, the children in us. Children love to discover, explore, create something a little beyond what they could before. It's not so much a hacker ethic as a hacker instinct. It's sort of like the baby ducks when they see their first moving object. That's <laughs> Computers are sort of a fascinating build-it set where you can build things that you can then use to build more things. What you're building is kind of alive. It has a life of its own. It's a little thing that follows all your commands. It allows you to put together structures that you couldn't have put together before and carry this on until you're making structures thousands of times as big. Once you figure out the, the solution to the puzzle, you can write the instructions down and then watch them execute you know, a million times a second. It's hard to pinpoint exactly where and when the hacker movement got started. This software genealogy chart branches out in every direction, from Boston's universities to California's Silicon Valley and back again. In his book, Hackers, journalist Steve Levy tracks it all the way back to MIT in the early 60s, where the first wave of hackers emerged, attracted by the university's large mainframe computers. They found times in the middle of the night, maybe in locked computer rooms, where, where they could do these things. And the things they did for fun on the computers were the things that turned out to be the things we use computers for now today, for really useful stuff. Machine time was extremely tight. Uh, in the early PDP-1 days, there was a sign-up list. And when the sign-up list appeared on Friday morning, in two hours, the machine had been completely signed up for the following week. 24 hours a day. Richard Greenblatt was one of the first and is perhaps the quintessential MIT hacker. Working night after night on primitive equipment, he helped develop the language of artificial intelligence. What uh, hackers did a lot was just hang around the, the machine. And, and you know somebody would find that they couldn't use all of their time, or maybe they'd be a little bit late showing up, or something or other like that. And so you could jump on the machine and do a few things, and then get off again. I'd get up around 5 or so and come into the lab, read the messages people would send me, then I'd go out to Chinatown with people and have a nice dinner. Then I'd come back and I would write programs all night and around 7 in the morning I'd go to sleep. Richard Stallman has been called the last pure hacker for choosing to remain at MIT despite the temptations of the commercial world true to the spirit of the early hackers. What they had in common was mainly love of excellence in programming. They wanted to make their programs that they used be as good as they could. They also wanted to make them do neat things. They wanted to be able to do something in a more exciting way than anyone believed possible and show, look how wonderful this is. I bet you didn't believe this could be done. It's old Program it right. No, the people that took a systematic approach toward the development of uh, computer software missed the boat. It was the trial and error people working illegally in the underground who made most of the advances. Bruderbund software publisher Doug Carlston got his first taste of computers in college as the hacker movement spread beyond MIT. It was the non-engineering students who were all learning structured code who were the hackers. The the liberal arts majors who, whose only computer time available was if they gummed up the locks and snuck into the building late at night because they weren't allowed to sign up for this stuff. We did everything by trial and error because we didn't have any courses. We didn't have access to anything other than the manuals. And as far as I'm aware, the whole group of midnight programmers there were people who didn't have any real functional use for what they were doing at all. I didn't know it was hacking then, and I only became aware of MIT when I got to Stanford. <laughs> Bruce Baumgart was one of the midnight programmers at the Stanford AI Lab, where he built robots by day and played an addictive game called Space War at night. 
to discover that PDP-1 is just was everything I possibly could have wanted, and to stay up all night with it was just uh, incredible. You know, you can get roll in at 9 p.m. and the physicists have left, and you can stay there till 9 a.m. when they rolled back in and <laughs> do it night after night. Like this primitive word processor, many of the early breakthroughs developed by hackers in university labs have since inspired some of today's most popular products. For instance, Space War was really the forerunner of modern video games. Sketchpad has influenced several contemporary drawing programs, and this crude flight simulator paved the way for recent commercial hits. In the early 70s, a second wave of hardware hackers and hobbyists surfaced in California's legendary Silicon Valley, triggered by the introduction of low-cost microprocessors. All my life, I knew I was going to have a computer. I was pretty much like the rest of the hackers. You, you, you reach a point in school where this has become so in this incredible thing in your life. You've got a uh, brochure, you've got uh, posters of computers on your wall instead of rock musicians. Steve Wozniak, nicknamed Woz by his friends, was one of the first to join the Homebrew Computer Club, whose members shared the same obsessive dream, to build their own home computer. What happened was just uh, the, uh, the environment changes. All of a sudden, the cost of the processors and the cost of enough memory to be a computer fell so low, you can actually afford to do it. You could get a computer you could think of as a home computer for an amount of money that you thought was OK. But by the time you got through with it, or it got through with you, you had spent almost 10 times the amount of money. You'd spent a lo much longer time. And you had had to dig in and learn the hard way, which is the best way. A central figure at the club meetings was activist Lee Felsenstein, designer of several early microcomputers and the first truly portable computer, the Osborne One. You had to learn about hardware if you thought you were only going to do software, or if you thought you were only going to plug a program in. Well, there was nothing to plug in. There was nowhere to plug it in. The thing, I didn't have any eyes and ears. I found a computer manual. I started learning what real mini computers were. I found other manuals on chips, and I started designing my own. I had no books that told me how to. You had to seek out people to help you in all of these matters. You had to get advice, and you had to learn to give as well as you got. That was sort of how I got my positive feedback in the world. I felt that I was something. The rest of the world didn't think microcomputers were going to mount to anything. I just thought, I had a neat one for my house. I'm going to show others. I'm going to even help them build their own. The design that Woz shared so freely with his homebrew computer friends became the Apple computer. It earned him over $50 million and paved the way for generations to come. The Apple's success is partly due to its open architecture, allowing users to tinker with the machine and improve on it. This hacker trademark was later adopted by IBM for its own personal computers in a radical departure from its traditional policy. As corporate America moved in and computer hardware became available to millions, a third wave of hackers set out to design software for their new machines. I got an Apple as soon as I could. I spent half my uh, salary that year on an Apple and basically flunked out like really fast because I was programming all the time on my Apple. In just a few years, self-made software artist Bill Budge designed dozens of programs and money started pouring in as the video game fad took America by storm. He remembers his first royalty check. And I was just blown away, you know, this is more money than I wanted to sell them for in one month's royalties. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah, by that time, graduate school was like, you know, rapidly becoming a thing of the past. I never intended to make money, it just sort of like hit me in the face. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> Another independent author to benefit from this short-lived cash bonanza is Robert Woodhead designer of wizardry a best-selling fantasy role-playing game inspired by dungeons and dragons we're wandering down a corridor here went around a corner that's a door we face it we kick through and we get an encounter and the little pointer changes to a sword to tell you what you've got these guys are fighting these guys and these guys are the ones i can control now since since i'm, I'm just doing a demonstration here i'm, I'm just going to throw the fusion bomb spell which i'm sure you'd appreciate that just vaporizes anything that, Whoops, I don't have any spell points with this, so it's for that. Nobody who is a professional programmer and considers himself a hacker actually works a day in his life. They all play. It's the challenge. I want that computer to do what I want it to do, and it's not doing it right yet. There's still a bug in that program, and I'm going to get that bug. And it's the challenge of making it work. 
Philosophical phone freaks and early hackers believe that information and tools should be free, or at least available to serious seekers, and they openly shared their work with others. Some argue that the computer revolution could not have happened without that hacker ethic. Back then, there was never a price tag on software. When someone wrote a program, they would uh, put it on paper tape and keep it in the drawer by the computer because the next person needed that program in order to run his programs. But today, hackers are divided between the old values and the new. They can't agree whether source codes, the basic blueprints of a program, should be shared or not. Hackers frequently want to look at code, like operating system listings and the like, to learn how it was done before them. Because this is how they're going to learn to do it. And uh, source should be made available reasonably to those sort of people. Not to copy, not to sell, but to learn from. Tools I will give away to anybody. But the product, that's, the, that's my soul is in that product. I don't want anyone fooling with that. I don't want anyone hacking in, in, into that product and changing it, because then it won't be mine. Imagine if you bought a house and the basement was locked and only the original building contractor had the key. If you needed to make any change, repair anything, you had to go to him. And if he was too busy doing something else, he'd tell you to get lost and you'd be stuck. It's like somebody saying, go, looking at a, a painting and saying, well, I don't like that color over there, so I'll just take a can of paint and change it. That wrecks the whole painting, okay? That, that changes everything that I did. And that, that to me, is, is one of the greatest insults. You're at that person's mercy, and you become downtrodden and resigned. That's what happens when the blueprints to a computer program are kept secret by the organization that sells it. And that's the usual way things are done. People are not trying to take protection off those because they want to learn from them. By and large, what they're trying to do is take the commercial value of those and either obtain it for themselves for free or possibly through swapping those with other people to obtain other people's uh, efforts for free. It's a totally different ballgame. Copy protection and software piracy are now big issues for hackers because with today's technology, anyone can copy in less than a minute a program that might have taken thousands of hours to create. In keeping with the hacker spirit, several authors have come up with interesting solutions to this problem. They're called freeware or shareware, software you can copy and try for free. You pay only if you decide you like it. The reason I started was because I finished this program, I was going to send it out, and I knew that I didn't have a prayer of coming up with a copy protection scheme that some kid in San Diego was going to break the first night. The late Andrew Flugelman, author of a free communications program called PC Talk, made pretty good money giving away his freeware, then charging $35 per satisfied user for support and updated versions. I tell people that whether they like it or not, give it to a friend, and if their friend likes it, then, then maybe they'll send me some money. I would guess that about one-tenth of the people who are using the program now have paid for it. And uh, there are a lot of uh, commercial software companies that can't make that claim. <laughs> Bob Wallace is another shareware author who's done fairly well with his free word processing program, PC Write. That is a way to give software away. That's a lot of fun. You get great letters and great phone calls. People are very appreciative, and they give you some great ideas. Um, at the same time, we'll grow us about 225,000 this year. Another channel for the free exchange of information is now available on various computer networks and electronic bulletin boards nationwide. By dialing these systems through a simple phone hookup called a modem, users can send and receive messages in seconds and chat with others thousands of miles away. This is what I uploaded to the source last night. I mean, mm -hmm. I was doing this. Are well, you already some people on the source organized a conference about the hackers convention called John Draper who ran up to me and we sat down and wrote it and this was on there last night and by this morning there were already 15 comments from other people across the country about what was going on here including questions that were fed back. David Hughes, nicknamed Source Void Dave, operates a very popular electronic bulletin board in Colorado Springs. I use it for politics, very heavy. I've been able to organize the defeat of, a, of an ordinance in the city of Colorado Springs. As a consequence, every politician in Colorado Springs calls my bulletin board to defend themselves against what other people are saying, and they're arguing with 10-year-old kids. So it's healthy electronic democracy. But electronic democracy also has its price. With so many channels of information available to the consumer, even the most dedicated hobbyists are now experiencing information overload. What's going to happen next is there's going to be so much information that we won't be able to have access. It won't be really available to us because it's, we're overwhelmed with it. There's been too much stuff created, which society did not have a need for that much of that kind of information. 
And it's not just information, it's also people and products. Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. In their enthusiasm, too many hackers have deluged the market with clever but often useless gadgetry. I think there are even too many computer people and computer hackers now. Too many people creating too many pieces of software and pieces of hardware to be useful. And that shows up in the fact that more money has been lost in personal computers by companies than has been made by winners. But some recent software hacks are apparently hitting home with the consumer, mainly because they serve a practical need. They're very visual, easy to use, and they're fun to play with. Simple applications like this movie maker program that lets you create your own cartoons, this music construction set that teaches you how to compose music, or this print shop that allows you to design and print your own greeting cards or stationery. Another popular hack is Mac Paint, really a blank canvas with electronic brushes and graphic tools allowing complete amateurs to paint intricate pictures, as Macintosh artist Susan Kerr explains. Say you wanted to do a little leaf border, which might take a while if you were really going to draw it leaf by leaf, but instead you just whip around with the eraser, so you can pull it off, rotate one, maybe take another one rotate that one so you can build up a little library of shapes to work with like a palette then you can say begin to drag away from those so that you can begin to build up a little border really fast pull it across i'm being sloppy but say you took 15 minutes to do this you could really get it just the way you want it so then you have a little border, and if you want to put it to work in a business situation, which is, as we know, very important for <laughs> this is, you, know, you can say, office picnic, and then you've uh, justified the expense to your department. The author of Mac Paint, Bill Atkinson, has designed a dazzling new application for his program. Called Mac Vision, it translates video or television pictures into computer images, which can then be retouched or printed as part of a letter. Uh, My camera. Dueling cameras. Name it your camera. Go like that. And then I say, scan me one. Now I can say, well, gee, I only want this much of it. I'll select that much. So then I could say, you know, you do all the standard, you know, make a negative out of it or, or uh, peel off copies of it or uh, flip it. Isn't that amazing? That is hot. Hacks like those only hint at what's yet to come. Some believe that the next breakthroughs will be triggered by the introduction of compact laser discs that can hold up to 600 million characters, or the equivalent of four copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Imagine using your computer to help you be able to ask, why do light bulbs burn out? And you see a picture of a light bulb and, and sort of other nodes of information you can just touch on and say, you know, just browse and steer through a large amount of information in a pleasant and enjoyable way. I mean, can you imagine a person now reading an encyclopedia cover to cover? Doesn't happen. But people spent hours and hours playing adventure, exploring some imaginary information. Well, if it were pleasurable and enjoyable to explore real live, all human knowledge, um, suddenly you've got a very uh, powerful learning tool where I can afford to take the time to find out why light bulbs burn out. I still don't know. <laughs> Late in the night, another vision of the future came true at the conference. This bizarre hack had one side of the audience compete against the other by averaging the action of the player's joysticks to make them play as one, turning an ordinary video game into an unusual team sport. It's that kind of passion and playful cleverness that once sparked the computer revolution and brought the hackers' dreams to life. Yeah, yeah, we got it. We got it. Go, 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 go. We still got it.
Outside the beaten path, at the cutting edge of new technology, the hacker spirit lives on. And for millions of new computer users, the adventure is just beginning. Unfortunately, that's all I can do.